The Last of the Plainsmen by Zane Gray. Chapter Two: The Range. After a much-needed rest at Emmett's, we bade good-bye to him and his hospitable family, and under the guidance of his men, once more took to the windswept trail. We pursued a southwesterly course now, following the lead of the craggy red wall that stretched on and on for hundreds of miles into Utah. The desert, smoky and hot, fell away to the left, and in the foreground a dark irregular line marked the Grand Canyon, cutting through the plateau. The wind whipped in from the vast open expanse, and meeting an obstacle on the red wall, turned north and raced past us. Jones's hat blew off, stood on its rim, and rolled. It kept on rolling, thirty miles an hour, more or less, so fast, at least, that we were a long time catching up to it with a team of horses. Possibly we never would have caught it had not a stone checked its flight. Further manifestation of the power of the desert wind surrounded us on all sides. It had hollowed out huge stones from the cliffs and tumbled them to the plain below, and then, sweeping sand and gravel low across the desert floor, had cut them deeply until they rested on slender pedestals, thus sculpturing grotesque and striking monuments to the marvelous persistence of this element of nature. Late that afternoon we reached the height of the plateau. Jones woke up and shouted, "'Ah, there's buckskin!' Far southward lay a long black mountain, covered with patches of shining snow. I could follow the zigzag line of the Grand Canyon, splitting the desert plateau, and saw it disappear in the haze round the end of the mountain." From this I got my first clear impression of the topography of the country surrounding our objective point. Buckskin Mountain ran its blunt end eastward to the canyon, in fact formed a hundred miles of the north rim. As it was nine thousand feet high it still held the snow, which had occasioned our lengthy desert ride to get back up the mountain. I could see the long slopes rising out of the desert to meet the timber. As we bowled merrily down grade, I noticed that we were no longer on stony ground, and that a little scant silvery grass had made its appearance. The little branches of green with the blue flowers smiled out of the clay sand. All of a sudden Jones stood up and let out a wild Comanche yell. I was more startled by the yell than by the great hand he smashed down on my shoulder, and for the moment I was dazed. There, look, look! the buffalo hi hey, hi hi below us a few miles on a rising knoll a big herd of buffalo shone black in the gold of the evening sun i had not jones's incentive but i felt enthusiasm born of the wild and beautiful picture and added my yell to his the huge burly leader of the herd lifted his head and after regarding us for a few moments calmly went on browsing the desert had fringed away into a grand rolling pasture land walled in by the red cliffs, the slopes of buckskin, and further isolated by the canyon. Here was a range of twenty-four hundred square miles without a foot of barbed wire, a pasture fenced in by natural forces, with the splendid feature that the buffalo could browse on the plain in winter, and go up into the cool foothills of buckskin in summer. From another ridge we saw a cabin dotting the rolling plain, and in half an hour we reached it. As we climbed down from the wagon, a brown and black dog came dashing out of the cabin and promptly jumped at Mose. This selection showed poor discrimination, for Mose whipped him before I could separate them. Hearing Jones heartily greeting someone, I turned in his direction, only to be distracted by another dogfight. Don had tackled Mose for the seventh time. Memory rankled in Don and needed a lot of whipping, some of which he was getting when I rescued him. Next moment I was shaking hands with Frank and Jim, Jones's ranchmen. At a glance I liked them both. Frank was short and wiry, and had a big, ferocious mustache, the effect of which was softened by his kindly brown eyes. Jim was tall, a little heavier. He had a careless, tidy look. His eyes were searching, and, though he appeared a young man, his hair was white. "'I sure am glad to see you all,' said Jim in a slow, soft, southern accent. Get down, get down, was Frank's welcome, a typically western one, for we had hardly gotten down. And come in, you must be worked out. Sure you've come a long way. He was quick of speech, full of nervous energy, and beamed with hospitality. The cabin was the rudest kind of log affair, with a huge stone fireplace in one end, 
deer antlers and coyote skins on the wall, saddles and cowboys' traps in the corner, a nice large promising cupboard, and a cable and chairs. Jim threw wood on a smoldering fire that soon blazed and crackled cheerily. I sank down into a chair with a feeling of blessed relief. Ten days of desert right behind me, promise of wonderful days before me, with the last of the old plainsmen. No wonder a sweet sense of ease stole over me, or that the fire seemed a live and joyously welcoming thing, or that Jim's deft maneuvers in preparation of supper aroused in me a rapt admiration. Twenty calves is spring, cried Jones, punching me in a sore side. Ten thousand dollars worth of calves. He was now altogether a changed man. He looked almost young, his eyes danced, and he rubbed his big hands together while he plied Frank with questions. In strange surroundings, that is, away from his native wilds, Jones had been a silent man. It had been almost impossible to get anything out of him. But now I saw that I should come to know the real man. In a very few moments he had talked more than on all the desert trip, and what he had said added to the little I had already learned put me in possession of some interesting information as to his buffalo. Some years before he had conceived the idea of hybridizing buffalo with black Galloway cattle, and with the characteristic determination and energy of the man, he at once set about finding a suitable range. This was difficult, and took years of searching. At last the wild north rim of the Grand Canyon, a section unknown, except to a few Indians and Mustang hunters, was settled upon. Then the gigantic task of transporting the herd of buffalo by rail from Montana to Salt Lake was begun. The two hundred and ninety miles of desert lying between the home of the Mormons and the Buckskin Mountain was an obstacle almost insurmountable. The journey was undertaken and found even more trying than had been expected. Buffalo after buffalo died on the way. Then Frank Jones's right-hand man put into execution a plan he had been thinking of, namely, to travel by night. It succeeded. The buffalo rested in the day and traveled by easy stages by night, which the result that the big herd was transported to the ideal range. Here, in an environment strange to the race, but particularly adaptable, they thrived and multiplied. The hybrid of the Galloway cow and buffalo proved a great success. Jones called the new species Catalo. The Catalo took the hardiness of the buffalo and never required artificial food or shelter. He would face the desert storm or blizzard and stand stock still in his tracks until the weather cleared. He became quite domestic, could be easily handled, and grew exceedingly fat on very little provender. The folds of his stomach were so numerous that they digested even the hardest and flintiest of corn. He had fourteen ribs on each side, while domestic cattle had only thirteen. Thus he could endure rougher work and longer journeys to water. His fur was so dense and glossy that it equaled that of the unplucked beaver or otter, and was fully as valuable as the buffalo robe. And not to be overlooked by any means was the fact that his meat was delicious. Jones had to hear every detail of all that had happened since his absence in the East, and he was particularly inquisitive to learn all about the twenty cattle calves. He called different buffalo by name, and designated the calves by descriptive terms such as white face and cross patch. He almost forgot to eat, and kept Frank too busy to get anything into his own mouth. After supper, he calmed down. "'How about your other man, Mr. Wallace, I think you said?' asked Frank. "'We expected to meet him at Grand Canyon Station, and then at Flagstaff. But he didn't show up. Either he backed out or missed us. I'm sorry.' for when we get up on buckskin among the wild horses and cougars, we'll be likely to need him. I reckon you'll need me as well as Jim, said Frank dryly, with a twinkle in his eye. The buffs are in good shape and can get along without me for a while. That'll be fine. How about cougar sign on the mountain? Plenty. We got two spotted coming over near Oak Spring two weeks ago. I tracked them in the snow along the trail for miles. We'll ease over that way, as it's going towards the Siwash. The Siwash breaks of the canyon. There's the place for lions. I met a wild horse wrangler not long back, and he was telling me about old Tom and the colts he'd killed this winter. Naturally, I expressed here a desire to know more of old Tom. 
He's the biggest cougar ever known in these parts. His tracks are bigger than a horse's and have been seen on buckskin for twelve years. This wrangler, his name is Chuck, said he turned his saddle horse out to graze near camp, and old Tom sneaked in and downed him. The lions over there are sure a bold bunch. Well, why shouldn't they be? No one ever hunted them. You see, the mountain is hard to get at. But now you're here, and if the big cats you want, we sure can find them. Only be easy. Be easy. You've all the time there is, and any job on buckskin will take time. We'll look the calves over, and you must ride the range to harden up. Then we'll ooze over towards Oak. I expect it'll be boggy, and I hope the snow melts soon. The snow hadn't melted on Greenland Point, replied Jones. We saw that with a glass from the El Tavar. We wanted to cross that way, but Rust said Bright Angel Creek was breast high to a horse, and that creek is the trail. There's four feet of snow on Greenland, said Frank. It was too early to come that way. There is only about three months in the year the canyon can be crossed at Greenland. I want to get in the snow, returned Jones. This bunch of long-eared canines I brought never smelled a lion track. Hounds can't be trained quick without snow. You've got to see what they're trailing, or you can't break them. Frank looked dubious. Pears to me we'll have trouble getting a lion without lion dogs. It takes a long time to break a hound off a deer, once he's chased him. Buckskin is full of deer, wolves, coyotes, and there's the wild horses. We couldn't go a hundred feet without crossing trails. How's the hound you and Jim fetched in last year? Has he got a good nose? Here he is. I like his head. Come here, Bowser. What's his name? Jim named him Sounder, because he sure has a voice. It's great to hear him on the trail. Sounder has a nose that can't be fooled, and he'll trail anything. But I don't know if he ever got up on a lion. Sounder wagged his bushy tail and looked up affectionately at Frank. He had a fine head, great brown eyes, very long ears, and curly brownish-black hair. He was not demonstrative, looked rather askance at Jones, and avoided the other dogs. "'A dog will make a great lion-chaser,' said Jones decisively, after his study of Sounder. "'He and Mose will keep us busy once they learn we want lions.' "'I don't believe any dog-trainer could teach them short of six months,' replied Frank. "'Sounder's no spring chicken, and that black and dirty white cross between a coyote and a barbed-wire fence—' is an old dog. You can't teach old dogs new tricks." Jones smiled mysteriously, a smile of conscious superiority, but said nothing. "'Well, sure I have a storm tomorrow,' said Jim, relinquishing his pipe long enough to speak. He had been silent, and now his meditative gaze was on the west, through the cabin window, where a dull afterglow faded after the heavy laden clouds of night, and left the horizon dark. I was very tired when I lay down, but so full of excitement that sleep did not soon visit my eyelids. The talk about buffalo, wild horse hunters, lions, and dogs, the prospect of hard riding and unusual adventure, the vision of old Tom, that had already begun to haunt me, filled my mind with pictures and fancies. The other fellows dropped off to sleep, and quiet reigned. Suddenly a succession of queer sharp barks came from the plain, close to the cabin, coyotes were paying us a call, and judging from the chorus of yelps and howls from our dogs, it was not a welcome visit. Above the medley rose a big, deep, full voice that I knew at once belonged to Sounder. Then all was quiet again. Sleep gradually benumbed my senses. Vague phrases dreamily drifted to and fro in my mind. Jones, wild range, old Tom, Sounder, great name, great voice sounder sounder sound next morning i could hardly crawl out of my sleeping bag my bones ached my muscles protested excruciatingly my lips burned and bled and the cold i had contracted on the desert clung to me a good brisk walk around the corrals and then breakfast made me feel better of course you can ride queried frank my answer was not given from an overwhelming desire to be truthful Frank frowned a little, as if wondering how a man could have the nerve to start out on a jaunt with Buffalo Jones without being a good horseman. To be unable to stick on the back of a wild mustang or a cayuse was an unpardonable sin in Arizona. 
My frank admission was made relatively, with my mind on what cowboys held as a standard of horsemanship. The mount Frank trotted out from the corral for me was a pure white, beautiful mustang, nervous, sensitive, quivering. I watched Frank put on the saddle, and when he called me, I did not fail to catch a covert twinkle in his merry brown eyes. Looking away toward Buckskin Mountain, which was coincidentally in the direction of home, I said to myself, This may be where you get on, but most certainly it is where you get off. Jones was already riding far beyond the corral, as I could see by a cloud of dust, and I set off after him, with the painful consciousness that I must have looked to Frank and Jim, much as Central Park equestrians had often looked to me. Frank shouted after me that he would catch up with us out on the range. I was not in any great hurry to overtake Jones, but evidently my horse's inclinations differed from mine. At any rate, he made the dust fly and jumped the little sage brushes. Jones, who had tarried to inspect one of the pools, formed of running water from the corrals, greeted me as I came up with this cheerful observation. What in thunder did Frank give you that white nag for? Buffalo hate white horses, anything white. They're liable to stampede off the range or chase you into the canyon. I replied grimly that, as it was certain something was going to happen, the particular circumstance might as well come off quickly. We rode over the rolling plain with the cool, bracing breeze in our faces. The sky was dull and mottled, with a beautiful cloud effect that pre-staged wind. As we trotted along, Jones pointed out to me and descanted upon the nutritive value of three different kinds of grass, one of which he called the buffalo pea noteworthy for a beautiful blue blossom. Soon we passed out of sight of the cabin, and could see only the billowy plain, the red tips of the stony wall, and the black fringe crest of buckskin. After riding a while, we met out some cattle, a few of which were on the range browsing in the lee of a ridge. No sooner had I marked them than Jones let out another Comanche yell. Wolf! he yelled, and spurring his big bay, he was off like the wind. A single glance showed me several cows running, as if bewildered, and near them a big white wolf pulled down a calf. Another white wolf stood not far off. My horse jumped, as if he had been shot, and the realization darted upon me that here was where the certain something began. Spot the Mustang had one black spot on his pure white, snorted like I imagined a blooded horse might, under dire insult. Jones's bay had gotten about a hundred paces the start. I lived to learn that Spot hated to be left behind. Moreover, he would not be left behind. He was the swiftest horse on the range, and proud of the distinction. I cast one unmentionable word on the breeze toward the cabin and Frank, then put mind and muscle to the sore task of remaining with Spot. Jones was born on a saddle, and had been taking his meals in a saddle for about sixty-three years, and the bay horse could run. Run is not a felicious word. He flew and I was rendered mentally deranged for the moment to see that hundred paces between the bay and Spot materially lessen at every jump. Spot lengthened out, seemed to go down near the ground, and cut the air like a high-geared auto. If I had not heard the fast rhythmic beat of his hoofs, and not bounced high into the air at every jump, I would have been sure. I was riding a bird. I tried to stop him. As well might I have tried to pull in the Lithuania with a thread. Spot was out to overhaul the bay, and in spite of me, he was doing it. The wind rushed into my face and sang in my ears. Jones seemed the nucleus of a sort of haze, and he grew larger and larger. Presently he became clearly defined in my sight. The violent commotion under me subsided. I once more felt the saddle, and then I realized that Spot had been content to stop alongside of Jones, tossing his head and chopping at his bit. "'Well, by George!' "'I didn't know you were in the stretch,' cried my companion. "'That was a fine little brush. "'We must have come several miles. "'I'd have killed those wolves if I'd have brought a gun. "'The big one that had the calf was a bold brute. "'He never let go until I was within fifty feet of him. "'Then I almost rode him down. "'I don't think the calf was much hurt. "'But those bloodthirsty devils will return, "'and like as not get the calf. "'That's the worst of cattle raising.' Now take the buffalo. Do you suppose those wolves could have gotten the buffalo calf out from under the mother? 
Never. Neither could a whole band of wolves. Buffaloes stick close together, and the little ones do not stray. When danger threatens, the herd closes in and faces it, and fights. That is what is grand about the buffalo, and what made them once roam the prairies in countless, endless droves. From the highest elevation in that part of the range, we viewed the surrounding ridges, flats and hollows, searching for the buffalo. At length we spied a cloud of dust rising from behind an undulating mound. Then big black dots hove in sight. Frank has rounded up the herd and is driving it this way. We'll wait, said Jones. Though the buffalo appeared to be moving fast, a long time elapsed before they reached the foot of our outlook. They lumbered along in a compact mass so dense that I could not count them, but I estimated the number to be at seventy-five. Frank was riding zigzag behind them, swinging his lariat and yelling. When he espied us, he reined in his horse and waited. Then the herd slowed down, halted, and began browsing. Look at the cattle low calves. See how shy they are, how close they stick to the mothers. The little brown fellows were plainly frightened. I made several unsuccessful attempts to photograph them and gave up when Jones told me not to ride too close and that it would be better to wait till we had them in the corral. He took my camera and instructed me to go on ahead, in the rear of the herd. I heard the click of the instrument as he snapped a picture, and then suddenly I heard him shout in alarm, Look out! Look out! Pull your horse! Thundering hoof-beats pounding the earth accompanied his word. I saw a big bull with his head down, tail raised, charging my horse. He answered Frank's yell of command with a furious grunt. I was paralyzed at the wonderfully swift action of the shaggy brute, and I sat helpless. Spot wheeled as if he were on a pivot, and plunged out of the way with a celerity that was astounding. The buffalo stopped, pawed the ground, and angrily tossed his huge head. Frank rode up to him, yelled, and struck him with the lariat whereupon he gave another toss of his horns, and then returned to the herd. "'It was that darned white nag,' said Jones. "'Frank, it was wrong to put an inexperienced man on spot. For that matter, the horse should never be allowed to go near Buffalo.' "'Spot knows the buffs. They'd never get to him,' replied Frank. But the usual spirit was absent from his voice, and he glanced at me soberly. I knew I had turned white.' for I felt the peculiar cold sensation in my face. "'Now look at that, will you?' cried Jones. "'I don't like the looks of that.' He pointed to the herd. They stopped browsing, and were uneasily shifting to and fro. The bull lifted his head. The others slowly grouped together. "'Storm! Sandstorm!' exclaimed Jones, pointing desertward. Dark yellow clouds like smoke were rolling, sweeping, bearing down upon us. They expanded, blossoming out like gigantic roses, and whirled and merged into one another, all the time rolling on and blotting out the light. "'We've got to run. That storm may last two days,' yelled Frank to me. "'We've had some bad ones lately. Give your horse free rein and cover your face.' A roar resembling an approaching storm at sea came on puffs of wind. As the horses got onto their stride, long streaks of dust whipped up in different places. The silver-white grass bent to the ground. Round bunches of sage went rolling before us. The puffs grew longer, steadier, harder. Then a shrieking blast howled on the arc trail, seeming to swoop down on us with a yellow, blinding pall. I shut my eyes and covered my face with a handkerchief. The sand blew so thick that it filled my gloves. Pebbles struck me hard enough to sting through my coat. Fortunately, Spot kept to an easy swinging lope, which was the most comfortable motion for me but I began to get numb, and could hardly stick on the saddle. Almost before I had dared to hope, Spot stopped. Uncovering my face, I saw Jim in the doorway, of the lee side of the cabin. The yellow, streaky, whistling clouds of sand split on the cabin and passed on, leaving a small, dusty space of light. "'Sure, Spot, do hate to be beat,' yelled Jim, as he helped me off. I stumbled into the cabin and fell upon a buffalo robe and lay there absolutely spent. Jones and Frank came in a few minutes apart, each anathematizing the gritty, powdery sand. All day the desert storm raged and roared. The dust sifted through the numerous cracks in the cabin, burdened our clothes, spoiled our food, and blinded our eyes. Wind, snow, sleet, and rainstorms are discomforting enough under trying circumstances, but all combined they are nothing to the choking, stinging, blinding sandstorm. 
sure it'll let up by sundown if you're jim and sure enough the roar died away about five o'clock the wind abated and the sand settled just before supper a knock sounded heavily on the cabin door jim opened it to admit one of emmett's sons and a very tall man whom none of us knew he was a sand man all that was not sand seemed a space or two of corduroy a big bone-handled knife a prominent square jaw and bronze cheek and flashing eyes get down get down come on in stranger said frank cordially how do you do sir said jones colonel jones i've been on your trail for twelve days announced the stranger with a grim smile the sand streamed off his coat in little white streaks jones appeared to be casting about in his mind i'm grant wallace continued the newcomer i missed you at l tower at williams and at flagstaff where i was one day behind was half a day late at the little colorado saw your train across moncapay wash and missed you because of the sandstorm there saw you from the other side of the big colorado as you rode out from emmett's along the red wall and here i am we've never met till now which obviously isn't my fault the colonel and i fell upon wallace's neck frank manifested his usual alert excitation and said well i guess he won't hang fire on a long cougar chase and jim slow careful jim dropped a plate with the exclamation sure it do beat hell the hound sniffed around wallace and welcomed him with vigorous tails supper that night even if we did grind sand with our teeth was a joyous occasion the biscuits were flaky and light the bacon fragrant and crisp i produced a jar of blackberry jam which by subtle cunning i had been able to secrete from the mormons on the dry desert ride and it was greeted with acclamations of pleasure wallace divested of his sand guise beamed with the gratification of a hungry man once more in the presence of friends and food he made large cavities in jim's great pot of potato stew and caused biscuits to vanish in a way that would not have shamed a hindu magician the grand canyon he dug in my jar of jam however could not have been accomplished by a ledger demain talk became animated on dogs cougars horses and buffalo jones told of our experience out on the range and concluded with some salient remarks a tame wild animal is the most dangerous of beasts my old friend dick rock a great hunter and guide out of idaho laughed at my advice and got killed by one of his three-year-old bulls i told him they knew him just well enough to kill him and they did my friend a h cole of oxford nebraska tried to rope a weeta that was too tame to be safe and the bull killed him same with general bull a member of the kansas legislature and two cowboys who went into a corral to tie up a tame elk at the wrong time i pleaded with them not to undertake it they had not studied animals as i had that tame elk killed all of them he had to be shot in order to get general bull off his great antlers you see a wild animal must learn to respect a man the way I used to teach the Yellowstone Park bears to be respectable and safe neighbors was to rope them around the front paw, swing them up on a tree clear of the ground, and whoop them with a long pole. It was a dangerous business and looks cruel, but it is the only way I could find to make the bears good. You see, they eat scraps around the hotels and get so tame they will steal everything but red-hot stoves and will cuff the life out of those who try to shoo them off but after a bear mother has had a licking she not only becomes a good bear for the rest of her life but she tells all her cubs about it with a good smack of her paw for emphasis and teaches them to respect peaceable citizens generation after generations one of the hardest jobs i ever tackled was that of supplying the buffalo for bronx park I rounded up a magnificent king buffalo bull, belligerent enough to fight a battleship. When I rode after him, the cowman said I was as good as killed. I made a lance by driving a nail into the end of a shorter pole and sharpening it. After he had chased me, I wheeled my bronco and hurled the lance into his back, ripping a wound as long as my hand. That put the fear of providence into him and took the fight all out of him. I drove him uphill and down and across canyons at a dead run for eight miles, single-handed, and loaded him on a freight car. But he came near getting me once or twice, and only quick bronco work and lance play saved me. 
In the Yellowstone Park all our buffaloes have become docile, excepting the huge bull which led them. The Indians call the buffalo leader the Weeta, the master of the herd. It was sure death to go near this one, so I shipped in another Weeta, hoping that he might whip some of the fight out of the old Manitou, the mighty. They came together head-on, like a railway collision, and ripped up over a square mile of landscape, fighting till night came on, and then on into the night. I jumped into the field with them, chasing them with my biograph, getting a series of moving pictures of the bullfight, which was sure a real thing. It was a ticklish thing to do, though, knowing that neither bull dared take his eyes off his adversary for a second. Felt reasonably safe. The old Weeta beat the new champion out that night, but the next morning they were at it again, and the new buffalo finally whipped the old one into submission. Since then his spirit has remained broken, and even a child can approach him safely. But the new Weeta is in turn a holy terror. To handle buffalo, elk, and bear you must get into sympathy with their methods of reasoning. No tenderfoot stands any show, even with the tame animals of the Yellowstone. The old buffalo hunter's lips were no longer locked. One after another he told reminiscence of his eventful life, in a simple manner yet so vivid and gripping were the unvarnished details that I was spellbound. Considering what appears the impossibility of capturing a full-grown buffalo, how did you earn the name of preserver of the American bison? inquired Wallace. It took years to learn how, and ten more to capture the fifty-eight that I was able to keep. I tried every plan under the sun. I roped hundreds of all sizes and ages. They would not live in captivity. If they could not find an embankment over which to break their necks, they would crush their skulls on stones. Failing any means like that, they would lie down, will themselves to die, and die. Think of a savage, wild nature that could will its heart to cease beating. But it's true. Finally I found that I could keep only calves under three months of age, but to capture them so young entailed time and patience. For the buffalo fight for their young, and when I say fight I mean they till they drop. I almost always had to go alone because I could neither coax nor hire anyone to undertake it with me. Sometimes I would be weeks on getting one calf. One day I captured eight, eight little buffalo calves. Never will I forget that day as long as I live. Tell us about it, I suggested in a matter-of-fact round-the-campfire voice. Had the silent plainsman ever told a complete and full story of his adventures? I doubted it. He was not the man to eulogize himself. A short silence ensued. The cabin was snug and warm. The ruddy embers glowed. One of Jim's pots steamed musically and fragrantly. The hounds lay curled in a cozy chimney corner. Jones began to talk again, simply and unaffectedly, of his famous exploit, and as he went on so modestly passing lightly over features we recognized as wonderful, I allowed the fire of my imagination to fuse for myself all the toil, patience, endurance, skill, Herculean strength and marvelous courage and unfathomable passion, which he slighted in his narrative. End of chapter 2